That may have been me. I don't okay. recommend you do both uh, because it is a 20 second delay and it'll just loop around. All right, I'm closing my camera and I'm listening and I'm going to post the documents that just came in and Representative Stevens, if you have any instructions for me along the way, I will hear you. Okay, we'll ask you to pull those up in, in just a couple of minutes. So welcome everybody. Um, as we've been, as we've been um, getting trained on this, this is, this is a meeting and it's being streamed live on YouTube. So it's a public meeting. Uh, one thing that Ron didn't mention is that the chat function uh, is, is available, but it is available only to everyone. And that's just something to keep in mind, um, keeping in mind with the, with the public aspect of the conversation that all uh, communications while we're in session, while we're talking during this, this meeting should be public. Um, it's part of the rules that have been set up over the last week or so as we move forward with this. Um, so this morning we're going to be talking about the committee bill that we started working on on March 12th and March 13th. And this is our committee uh, COVID response. We have um, with us listening in, um, first of all, Emily Long cannot make this meeting. She's in another meeting at the same time. Um, the, the other witnesses that we've had here uh, are including uh, Damien and David Hall, uh, as well as uh, folks that I invited were Rick DeAngelis, uh, Chris Donnelly, uh, I see Jean Murray's on the call, as well as Wendy Morgan from Vermont Legal Aid and Angela Zakowski from the apartment owners. Um, this is all in information, especially relating to housing that, that these folks have either chimed in on or will chime in on this particular piece of legislation. Um, we will be meeting this morning and then again this afternoon. We are now allowed to vote on um, via this this uh, technology. We'll check with Ron to see exactly how that would work if and when we're ready to vote at any point today um, on, on this legislation. We'll have to deal with that with the clerk, with Mary, and try to figure out how to how we're going to uh, make that make that um, work with our paperwork. So with that, I just wanted to have uh, Damien and David chime in or start this conversation to discuss um, and I'm not, I'm not sure who's the first, who's the best person first, but um, just to talk about the, what we had, um, perhaps what has already been covered by executive order and where we need to go from here in order to make sure that what we dealt with, um, that we can, that we can move forward as, as reasonable legislation that'll help Vermonters over the next few months. So actually, Damien, I'll start with you, if that's okay. And I am unmuting you. Are you all set? I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you. And so Ron, if you could put up, uh, would it be helpful, Damien, if Ron put up the uh, document? I'm uh, posting um, it right now. Yeah, so uh, probably, well, there, there's a couple of things to talk about. Um, one is the bill draft we had before we, we left the state house. Uh, and then the other is um, what passed in uh, the Families First Coronavirus uh, Act, um, which added federal sick time and uh, leave legislation um, because a big portion of our bill had dealt with sick time and leave. Um, and then after that, I think it probably makes sense to transition to David because all of the changes to the committee's work have come through uh, in the housing area, which is, is David's focus. Um, so just to maybe Ron, if we could start with uh, the draft that David sent this morning. Okay, so um, let's see if I can pull this off. Share screen. Okay. And All right, so I don't 
I just posted a document. I guess it's this one right here. As you can see, I've got several from uh, the the one under David Hall, draft two point two, dated three twenty six twenty twenty. That's the most current draft of the committee bill. Okay. Now, can everyone see that? I'll just assume yes. Yeah, it's coming through clear on my screen, Ron. So I assume okay, everyone so can. What would you like for me um, to do? If, if you scroll down to the break between pages two and three, that's where we'll start. I mean, that's the break. What? what? Um, your, your screen hasn't quite caught up. There we go. Perfect. Um, so uh, just to kind of remind people what we've done before. So we made a couple changes in Vermont's um, Parental and Family Leave Act, or we're proposing a couple changes. Uh, the first was to reduce the employer size to uh, employers for purposes of COVID-19 related leave. Uh, employers who employ five or more employees for an average of 30 hours a week over the course of the year. And then we were adding this uh, provision here, if you can scroll down just a hair further wrong, um, to basically allow people to take family leave pursuant to a request from a medical professional, local health official or the commissioner of health that the employee be isolated or quarantined as a result of COVID-19, regardless of whether they've been diagnosed. And so this was to address both folks who uh, were sick with COVID-19 as well as folks who had been exposed to it and were being asked to quarantine. Um, so that this was the first change that we were proposing. The second change uh, that the committee was proposing, um, if we could scroll down to the top of page five, was to allow employees to take, uh, use their earned sick time for isolation or quarantine related to COVID-19, um, regardless of whether they've been diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, and keep in mind that you're already allowed to use uh, earned sick time to deal with uh, the closure of a school. Um, and that Vermont law provides for about five days of earned sick time. Um, so to put all of this in perspective, I think it, it helps to take a look at uh, the, Ron, if you could pull up the updated summary of employment specific provisions from HR 6201. Okay. And I'll just go through the key takeaways for the committee. Um, So what, what happened while we were away uh, is that the federal government passed um, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, and I may be getting that name a little wrong, but for our purposes, it did two things that were very important. It expanded uh, FMLA um, and it also expanded, uh, it created a federal paid sick time law for the first time. Uh, both of these are temporary expansions um, and they have significant limitations. Uh, the FMLA expansion um, allows uh, folks to take leave if their school or child care is closed and the child care provider is unavailable. It's really important to note though that it does not apply to any employers over 500 employees which only makes up two tenths of 1% of Vermont's private employers, but they employ almost 15% of the private sector employees in Vermont. The other piece is it doesn't apply, it potentially does not apply to uh, employers with 50, um, with fewer than 50 employees, uh, if they can demonstrate an economic hardship that would affect the viability of their business as a going concern. It is not clear how the US Secretary of Labor is going to construe 
that economic hardship exemption and how liberally those will be granted. Um, but uh, that potentially affects over 96% of Vermont's private employers uh, who employ about 52% of the private sector employees in Vermont. Uh, so there, there is potential one that this law may not apply to a great deal of Vermont employers, um, or at least uh, potentially half of Vermont employees could be exempt uh, or not covered by this law. The other piece is the leave is unpaid for the first 10 days, um, but then the employer is required to pay two thirds of the employee's normal wages up to a maximum of uh, $200 per day, which basically covers um, at the full two thirds wage replacement, employees earning up to about $75,000 a year. And beyond that, you'd see diminishing returns. Um, and then uh, it also eases job protection requirements to something more similar to what we had in our, uh, in the paid sick leave bill that passed the legislature, but was vetoed by the governor, where the employer is basically tried uh, if the employee's job is eliminated, they're not required to hold it open. They're just required to, uh, if an equivalent job becomes available, offer that to the employee. Um, so that's the FMLA expansion. Um, the other piece here, if we can scroll down to the bottom of the page, was the sick leave expansion for COVID-19. Uh, and this covers, oh, there we go. Um, again, this only applies through the end of the year. It would provide up to 80 hours of paid sick leave for full-time employees. And then part-time employees receive um, a proportionate amount of that based on the hours that they work in a two-week two period uh, on average. Um, the maximum uh, amount per day is $511. Um, and it's basically, it's full, full regular pay, um, up to a max of 511 per day, which covers employees earning up to 130,000 a year, which is almost all of the employees in Vermont. Uh, and then, um, but that's only for the employee's own illness. If you're caring for a family member, including for a child out of school, it's two thirds of the regular rate of pay, um, up to a max of $200 per day. Uh, and for those employees who earn less than minimum wage, they'd be compensated at minimum wage. Um, and the sick leave is in addition to any leave that's already provided by the employer. So it would actually complement Vermont laws. It doesn't preempt Vermont's law. Uh, and then um, the sick leave has to be used first. And it's for the illness of the employee or a quarantine requirement or the illness of a family member or a family member who's under quarantine uh, or closure of school. And it has the same um, potential exemptions. The for employers of 500 or more are exempt uh, outright and employers with fewer than 50 employees uh, can apply for an economic hardship exemption. Uh, so that, that's what passed uh, Congress already. So, uh, what those do is they raise the question of whether uh, the expansion to Vermont's unpaid family leave law um, and the earned sick time law are, are necessary at this point. Um, and uh, so it's, that's a policy question for you uh, to consider moving forward is whether you want to continue to address that. Um, Another important thing to note uh, is that the bill that passed the US Senate last night, and I've provided um, a preliminary summary of that, um, that bill dramatically expands unemployment compensation uh, for employees who are laid off or whose hours are reduced to zero during, um, during this crisis. Uh, so it provides extended benefits. Uh, so typically unemployment benefits run for 26 weeks. They'll now run for 39 weeks. Uh, 
it also provides enhanced benefits. So your normal unemployment benefits under state law are 57% of your average weekly wage. On top of that amount, the federal bill, assuming it passes the House on Friday, uh, will provide an additional $600 per week uh, to recipients of unemployment compensation. It also extends unemployment assistance to self-employed and independent contractors, uh, sole proprietors, that sort of thing. In addition, it provides loan assistance to small businesses to help them meet payroll, uh, utilities, rent, mortgage payments, that sort of thing during the crisis, uh, and provides um, tax credits uh, against payroll taxes for employers who keep their employees on during the crisis. Um, and uh, the tax credit is, is uh, a 50% refundable tax credit on the first $10,000 of compensation, including the cost of healthcare benefits. Um, the other piece here to keep in mind with the, the sick leave and family leave expansion is that employers are provided with a refundable tax credit against their, uh, their business, quarterly business taxes um, for the amount of sick leave and paid leave paid out. Uh, there are concerns that have been expressed as I understand it about the delay in receiving that money back from the federal government. Um, but I think the Thinking at the federal level is that between the additional loan assistance uh, and the payroll tax credit, and then the tax credit for any leave that's paid out, um, they're covering a lot of the bases. Um, obviously, there are a lot of policy questions about that, um, but the, the goals I think with the federal legislation have been to enable people to take some time off uh, and also to um, allow employers to be able to afford those costs to some extent. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions, um, but that kind of gives you a status update for where the draft legislation was, what the feds have done, and it leaves the question open for you about, as a policy matter, whether you want to continue looking into expanding um, the unpaid leave and the earned sick time. I know the Senate um, before uh, they were instructed to limit their bill to the unemployment insurance provisions that had been agreed on between the House and the Vermont Senate. Um, they had briefly looked at expanding the unpaid leave to also cover school closures. Um, although with the, the federal law now in place, uh, if your employer is keeping you on, you're eligible for paid leave as long as your employer is not exempt. Uh, from the bill. So extending unpaid leave to cover that would essentially just potentially protect employees who work for an employer who has an economic hardship exemption. As a practical matter, it may be better for those employees to seek unemployment insurance benefits. And the, the bill that passed uh, our Vermont House yesterday uh, would enable people to seek unemployment insurance benefits if they have to quit their job to take care of a child who's out of, out of school or who doesn't have childcare anymore. Uh, and it also permits their employers to temporarily lay them off by reducing their hours to zero so that they can either because, uh, um, not because of school closure, but because of uh, governmental closure by the, uh, for example, the governor's executive order um, where he's closed a number of businesses, either partially or completely. Um, so to the extent those businesses have to uh, lay people off or reduce their hours to zero, they're able to do that and people are able to get unemployment. Um, so I'll stop talking at this point and um, take any questions you have. And otherwise, uh, I'll let David take over. Well, I've got one question so far from Chip Triano. Chip, you're unmuted. Thanks. Uh, Damien, my question is, uh, I've heard from a lot of folks uh, on self-employed uh, benefits. Um, so um, under either Ver the Vermont or the federal uh, um, 
the federal um, accommodations on this, does that cover the carpenter who takes jobs as they come, or does it require for a self-employed individual to be a uh, sole proprietorship? Do we know that? So uh, my understanding um, with the federal legislation, which it's just passed the US Senate, it still has to pass the US House. Um, and then uh, the president is expected to sign it, the house is expected to pass it on Friday. So uh, presumably it will be law by the end of the weekend. Um, that would expand coverage to self-employed, including sole proprietors and independent contractors. Uh, so I don't think it's limited to sole proprietors. Um, and uh, let me just pull up my summary here. Um, and just see if I can get Okay, so to, in order to be eligible for it, it it's a program for self-employed independent contractors and workers with insufficient employment history to qualify for regular UI. So it's a pretty broad group. Uh, in order to qualify, uh, you have to be first ineligible for UI, which a, a sole proprietor or an independent contractor would be. Um, and then you have to self-certify that you're, you, would, you would be able and available to work but cannot work or are unemployed because you're either sick with COVID-19, you have a family member who's sick with COVID-19, you're caring for a family member with COVID-19 or for a COVID-19 related purpose, your school, child's school or child care is closed, you're quarantined because of COVID-19, You've been advised to self-quarantine, which could include a health condition. Um, you had a job, but you were unable to start it because of COVID-19. So for example, someone who was about to start working at a, um, for a business that's been closed down because of the virus. Um, the head of household and or uh, the breadwinner in your household died because of COVID-19. Um, you had to quit your job because of COVID-19. Your place of employment closed because of COVID-19, um, or you're self-employed or otherwise would not qualify for unemployment insurance. So there's there's kind of a variety of, of reasons here. Um, the things that would prevent you from getting it is if your job allows you to telework and you're able to telework. Um, or you're receiving paid sick leave or paid leave benefits through your employer. Um, so it provides up to 39 weeks of benefits uh, and it would be the weekly benefit allowed under state UI law. So it basically looks at that self-employed person's income, their average weekly income, and then takes 57% of that and then will add $600 additional per week to that as an enhanced um, pandemic response. There's no waiting period for it. Um, the big key piece here is, so this is still in process at the federal level. And what I'm not sure about is once we get passage, um, how quickly our Department of Labor will be able to start approving applications for benefits under this. Um, but I would expect some small delay before those applications start getting approved. Uh, and I can reach out to the department, which is uh, absolutely inundated with claims right now, um, but they're doing their best to respond to our questions um, and see, see how quickly they expect that. But I would want to hold off on that until the federal package uh, is finalized. All right, uh, Matt, you're up next, and then John has his hand up as well. Matt, you are on. Uh, Got it. You are unmuted. Thank you. Um, hi, Dan. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing fine. Doing fine. Um, so I have, a, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, and I think some of it was answered already, but just like clarity. Um, so does the executive order from the governor meet the definition of quarantine under the federal bill? 
I had an employer uh, so ask the, me that question. Uh, the executive order. The state um, home. That's a, a good question. I'd have to look back at the specific language in the bill. Um, okay. Please understand that it's a 692 page bill. I know. Yeah. Um, and I, I blasted through it in about three hours last night. So I wasn't reading every word very closely. Yeah. Um, so about 200 pages of it deal with employment and small business issues, which is what I tried mm -hmm. to focus on. Um, but I know that if you're an employee and your business has been closed due to COVID-19, you're eligible for UI under our the changes we just put through in the state UI law. That was my next uh, question. The small so does that kind of, does that like circumnavigate the like FMLA? Like like so, so like if yeah, basically the the way to think about it is the FMLA provisions cover you if um, they cover you if your child's school or child care is closed and you have to be out of work for an extended period of time. Federal sick leave gives you, and that's only if your employer can keep you on. Remains, yeah, remains so, operational, yes. Exactly, so if your employer temporarily lays you off, then um, uh, you're, you're not um, covered by that and you'd have to go for UI. Okay, so, so, um, so any any form of layoff, just it's like straight to UI, and then so these other sort of provisions that are in place are not relevant. It's just like straight right. to straight to UI. You go, do not pass go, do not collect. Well, actually, you're gonna collect, but yes, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, okay. yep. So, and the UI I should note too covers instances where employers have had to reduce hours. So basically, um, the way that works is, uh, let's say I work 40 hours a week and my employer has cut me down to eight hours a week. So just 20% of, of my normal uh, working hours. What would happen is I apply for UI uh, and they do a income disregard for uh, that 20% that I'm still working. And they, they basically deduct that from my UI award. And so they take that into account and then they pay you, um, the balance, they basically yeah. disregard 50% of the income you're bringing in and the rest gets deducted from your award. Um, and we, we have the most uh, generous income disregard in the country. So okay. for folks who are partially unemployed, um, our system works pretty well here in Vermont. And then with the enhanced federal benefits, that'll also be really helpful to people. Um, yeah, so and so it keeps them whole while they're experiencing reduced hours. Exactly, so or a full layoff. Yeah, yeah. One thing that um, employers, some employers are considering doing or have done at this point is reducing people's hours to zero, but continuing to pay their health benefits. Mm. So people keep their insurance. Um, but then, or at least continuing to pay the employer portion, but then they're eligible for unemployment because their hours have been reduced to zero. Um, okay. So that, that's another thing that's out there. The, the federal bill uh, that's working its way through right now provides a tax credit to employers that keep people on their payroll um, and uh, encourages employers to keep people on their payroll and keep them working or at least paid as if they're working. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't, um, I haven't had a chance yet to fully wrap my head around how all these pieces will work, but there are a number of options for employers depending on their situation. There are uh, short-term small business loans that will be available. Yep. Um, there are the tax credits. Uh, and the, the payroll tax is actually, it's a deferral for two years on the payroll tax amount. So you pay, um, the first round is paid at the end of December, 2021. The second round is paid at the end of December, 2022. 
And this is all outlined in the four page preliminary summary I sent to you. Um, so it's something you can kind of look through, but there are, there are options for employers to try to keep people on. And then there are enhanced unemployment benefits for folks who need to be let go to, to try to keep things coming. And that doesn't address the rebate checks that are also part of this program that are gonna be sent to individuals based on their income. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, John is up next. John, you're unmuted. And then Tommy. Thank you. Uh, Damien, I, I'm trying to keep up with the distinctions. And so I want to make sure I understood that the federal bill is exempting employers with 50 or more, right? And our fewer. bill. For our, our bill in, that, that we had proposed had parental family leave employing 10 or more and the family leave employing 15 or more. So is, is there now a discrepancy between what our bill says and what the, the federal bill is gonna be offering? And is that something we need to address in our committee? Or did so I just I, I mean, thank you. you. You've zeroed in on the policy question here. So just to be clear, the federal bill if you employ 500 or more employees, you are completely exempt. If you employ fewer than 50 employees, which is 96% of Vermont businesses, uh, you are eligible to apply for an economic hardship exemption. Um, so if it would uh, jeopardize the viability of your business as a going concern is the, uh, the federal language and that's in the determination of the Secretary of Labor, and we, we don't yet know how that's gonna be applied. But if that's the case, then you can apply for and potentially be granted an exemption from the requirements. What our law does is it covers unpaid um, uh, family leave. And so the proposal that you had in front of you would have extended it for COVID-19 related reasons to employers of five or more uh, employees working an average of 30 hours a week, um, which would have increased the percentage of employers covered for purposes of unpaid leave uh, and job protection. Um, the what our bill did not do is provide any sort of requirement that there be uh, pay during that period. Um, and it also only extended it to issues of quarantine. It didn't extend it to school closure, which is what the federal law applies to. So the federal law covers just school closure. Our bill was aimed at quarantine. Um, so those are, I think the questions for the committee are, is it still necessary to provide job protection? Um, if so, is five or more at an average of 30 hours a week the appropriate number? And should it be left at just quarantine or should it be extended to school and childcare closures? Um, and then the, the final piece of that um, is just the consideration of uh, do some of the provisions, for example, in unemployment insurance, the unemployment insurance expansion provide comparable or better coverage at this point where instead the employer, you could quit your job or the employer could lay you off um, depending on the situation. So the employer layoff provisions are related to things affecting um, they're basically three scenarios. One is um, the employer is closed down because of uh, a specific public health or governmental order, or because there's been ex voluntarily closing because there's been exposure of employees to COVID-19. Uh, the second is a broad order by the governor or the president closing a whole swath of businesses. So this is what the governor has been doing in his executive orders. Um, gradually closing the businesses where um, uh, that can be open for person-to-person -person interactions. Uh, so for affected businesses there, say for example, you work at a hotel, 
that's not providing uh, uh, essential COVID-19 services like housing the homeless, um, then you could be laid off by your hotel be pursuant to the governor's order and be eligible for UI. The other coverage under our UI law is for folks who have to quit for a, a COVID-19 related reason. And that's where you voluntarily quit. Normally this quitting a job you have to do work at a hotel. I'm sorry. Uh, I, it, is there an echo or was someone trying to ask a question? Uh, there was, someone came on with the uh, YouTube oh, okay. delay in the background. That's been okay. muted. Great, so um, the, the other option is normally you're not covered if you quit, but our expansion of the state's UI law allows you to quit for a variety of COVID-19 related reasons, um, including that your child is, uh, uh, has their school or child care closed. So assume you have the instance of um, you work for an employer uh, that doesn't provide you with the paid leave. Um, you could instead quit your job to take care of your child and receive unemployment insurance. So I, I know that may not make things much more clear, but the, the real question for you guys on the paid leave is, do you expand the basis that you can take it for? Do you expand the employers that it applies to? And is it necessary if there are other avenues where people might be able to receive pay um, if they aren't covered by the federal expansion? Um, so, so let's just leave uh, that right there. That's, that's yeah. a good, you know, that's a good um, policy discussion in a bit. Um, John, are you all set? Yes, thank you. Okay, Tommy, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm not totally clear on what might happen uh, to those who are underemployed. Uh, so for example, let's say an employee who's, whose normal work week is 30 hours and they're cut down to 20 or 15. Are they then eligible for the family leave because they're not working the normal amount of hours? Just, just what can we do for them? So for, uh, for that instance, um, they would be eligible for partial unemployment. Um, so uh, they, they would essentially be able to go to our unemployment office and apply for partial unemployment where what they do is they take into account what their normal average work hours and wages are and then look at the reduction and they pay them a prorated amount based on that reduction. Um, if your hours are not cut down significantly, um, the, income, the uh, income deduction may actually wipe out your um, unemployment benefits, but if your hours have been cut significantly, um, then you may still be a bit uh, eligible for some unemployment. Um, and then assuming that the, the federal law goes through with the enhanced unemployment payments, which is a federal, uh, an additional amount covered by the federal government of $600 per week added to those checks, um, you could potentially be made whole or um, in some cases, and this was one of the issues that uh, almost derailed the bill last night in the U.S. Senate. Um, individuals with lower incomes may come out ahead uh, if they're unemployed or partially unemployed. Mm. Um, so, um, but it, in that case, if you're either way, if your hours are reduced, your likely option is to go for partial unemployment. Um, you likely unless you're reducing your hours to care for a family member, um, you're likely not taking advantage of a paid sick time or a paid family leave uh, type provision. Thank you. Okay. All right, any further questions for Damien right now? I wanna be mindful of the time. Um, 
I do believe that some of these issues will also be discussed in the Senate, uh, our sister committee in the Senate on this, this afternoon, I believe they're up at noon. So um, Damien, I don't know if there's anything, if you wanna shift over and prepare for that meeting, um, then we can be done with you for right now. And, and um, we'll have a discussion over what the policy choices that you laid out for us are and we'll go from there but i want to get over to the housing section of our of our covid bill um as well so yeah, thank I'll, you for I'll stay on the call here i'll just turn off my camera and and mute this the uh, mute myself and then just listen in while i work on other things sounds good thank you great so next up is um david ron if you could um put the bill back up um to uh, show the second half of our bill. And David, if you could just start walking through it. I know that, um, David, most of the original work on this bill was done, I believe, with by Damien, but that we asked you to come on a couple of days ago because of your expertise in the housing issues. And um, you were given um, some, you were given our draft and then, and then some thoughts from Vermont Legal Aid on some of the issues. We haven't had an opportunity to share this until today with uh, the apartment owners. So this is the first day that they've seen it. And um, so if you could just take us through what we have in front of us, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, sure, can everybody hear me okay? Or please tell me if you can't hear me okay. Um, Mr. Sound. Chair, a quick question for you. Is it, um, is it good for Ron to continue sharing his screen and using it, or should I share my screen and walk through? Um, well, Ron, if you're on the if you're if you're available to to answer that question, is it easier for David to share his screen? Can he do that easily? Uh, David, do you have the share function? I'm sorry. Uh, let me see if I can give you the ability to share the screen. Uh, I have it on the bottom of my page. Then go for it. Okay. Can everybody see that? That's that's yours. Yep, that's a different screen. Great. Uh, the only problem is that I can't seem to enlarge it without pulling up my... Just one moment. It's, it's legible from here. Just one moment. Okay, and I'm gonna share again. Okay, good. That looks, I, I can see that just fine. Um, and just Great. a reminder to folks, if you have a question, um, please don't forget to raise your hand and we will get to you when, when we have a place to ask qu questions. Thanks, David. Sure. So for your record, David Hall, Legislative Council, nice to be with you all. Um, I hope my internet holds up. We had five people working at home, many of us, most of us using video for school or work. So uh, it's a lot of demand on my system, but I think it's holding up. Um, so as to this bill, I actually did draft the original provisions in section seven, eight, and nine. Um, and so if you've seen the previous version or what's it's still in here, um, those are the original pieces. Uh, seven and eight are the same as before. I have preserved the original nine, and then there is a new section nine based on uh, a proposal by Vermont Legal Aid. <clears throat> so that's new as of last night and this morning. So I, you know, I might have to lean on other people if there are questions that I can't answer, but. Um, you know, other than that, I think we can go through seven, eight, and nine if that's what you'd like me to do. Okay, so right now, section seven of this bill has a live appropriation of five million dollars. Um, that was a placeholder section, it's a placeholder number. I have no idea whether there will be actual money in this bill and how much, that is completely up to you. Um, and I also leave it to you to coordinate whether the dollars flow in this vehicle or in some sort of budget vehicle. But for right now, uh, the way it's constructed, it would be a $5 million appropriation from the general fund 
It's actually two DCF to provide emergency related housing assistance pursuant to section eight. The reason that it is to DCF is because uh, the way I've constructed section eight is to have DCF work in collaboration with DCD and VHCD, other partners as necessary uh, to administer that funding. And I've based the administration of that funding completely on the housing opportunity grant programs that are run through DCF as it is. So these, these subdivisions you're about to see in subsection A are all functions that they serve through those programs right now. And this would be additional funding for that approach. Obviously what you need to consider is how much money to whom it should go and for what purpose, whether this is too broad, too narrow, are these the right people? Um, obviously those are significant questions, but in section, subsection A here, again, DCF working with DHCD, VHCD and other partners shall adopt policies and procedures to administer funding for housing related emergency relief, specifically necessitated by the spread of COVID-19, including housing search and placement, housing stability case management, landlord tenant mediation, follow up and supportive services to maintain housing, financial assistance for security deposits and rental payments, rental arrears, short-term rental assistance, and the purchase or lease of existing housing units for purposes of isolation or quarantine related to COVID-19. That's obviously a lot of stuff. How far does $5 million go if you're trying to do all of those things? I don't know. Um, subsection B, DCF shall develop a process for outreach to community partners, landlords, and tenants. Two, develop an expedited application process for emergency relief. Three, develop criteria for prioritizing emergency funding based on the income of applicants, projected duration and severity of the individual and statewide need for assistance, other relevant factors the department identifies in its discretion. So on C, DCF shall maintain adequate records and data concerning funding it provides pursuant to the section, make that information available to the General Assembly, and under D, DCF and DHCD shall provide information, technical assistance, and necessary guidance to homeless shelters, community housing partners, and landlord and tenant associations concerning the resources and requirements of this act, as well as relevant existing sources. So that's seven and eight together. That's sort of the uh, state appropriated relief side of the bill as drafted thus far and then uh, nine will switch to sort of shutoffs evictions foreclosures etc so let me stop there and uh, defer to you mr chair on whether you'd like to discuss seven and eight together now or continue with nine um well i'm gonna i'll put that out to i have two questions um in line here and i'll just let those questions get asked i mean my take on the five million dollars is that it is a placeholder that this is um no one knows what this would cost eventually or even initially um but we will you know unless this there's a discussion on this um i'd like to keep it as a placeholder and let the conversation continue because this is going to get tied into whether or not we receive the adequate funding for for this through the federal government as well i know that there is some money available for these kinds of um perhaps for these kinds of programs available but i'm not sure how we would get to that um so i'm gonna open up um john Kalaki, no lisa hango first and then john and then chip but let me mute let me find you, Lisa. And Lisa, you are unmuted on my end. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can. So my question is very basic and it goes back to our discussion of um, probably the week of March 10th when we were last together in committee. Um, this allocation and this um, program that we're proposing is strictly for people who are homeless and 
if they are homeless, does this also cover people who would be homeless because they're displaced due to COVID-19 considerations in whatever shelter they're in? Or um, is it anyone who is homeless regardless of COVID-19 considerations. And my second part to the question is, does DCF currently administer, I know they do work with DHCD and VHCB, but do they currently administer a program such as this trying to find shelter for individuals? So David, this, the way this is written right now, it is not limited to homeless persons. Um, there are specific uh, components to it that do address the homeless population and providers, uh, namely the last subsection, which talks about technical assistance and other resources specifically for the homeless population. But it, as you'll see in subsection A here, uh, it, is, it is housing related relief necessitated by Is my internet okay? Yeah, I'm still getting you. Okay, I, I am apologize. not. All right, Lisa's not hearing David. Everybody have me okay? Yes. Okay. So, uh, let me continue. So the subsection A and the money broadly uh, applicable to housing related assistance. And it, it sort of ties into the second part of your question. This is all based on uh, current programs that the DCF operates. Again, it's the HOP programs. And they do already provide the types of assistance um, that are specifically articulated here. And those are, are not limited to, to the homeless. Does that answer your question? It does, but it brings up another question. So I know that we're always trying to find resources for folks. What does establishing extra funding during the time of this crisis do for crisis relief in, and by crisis relief, I'm talking about COVID-19. What are we trying to do here? Because we've pretty much been directed to work on, at least as far as I know, emergency relief due to the COVID-19 crisis. So to establish a program to help people find housing that is unrelated to the COVID-19 crisis, I'm not sure that that's what our mission is supposed to be now. And um, I know we're exploring various avenues, but I, I'm i just not sure what road we're going down here. It sounds like we're going down a road that's a lot broader than just COVID-19 relief. Um, well, so in section seven, on the bottom of page seven, you'll see in line 20, the money is appropriated to provide emergency housing related assistance pursuant to section eight. So um, that's one tie in to the emergency nature of this assistance. And then on the next page um, on line seven, the directive is to adopt policies and procedures to administer funding for housing related emergency relief that is specifically necessitated by the spread of COVID-19. Okay, so that's all well and good. I'm just, I guess I'm unclear what housing relief is needed due to the spread of COVID-19. If it's not particularly pertaining to homeless people, I can certainly understand the homeless situation where being in shelters with each other would necessitate more space needed. I'm not sure what people who are currently housed are experiencing for housing situation, house, housing emergency situations um, that would necessitate 
extra funds being allocated for that because I know we're we're talk we're also talking about um, moratoriums on evictions and arrearages help with arrearages so not quite certain where the rest of that is going to go to the general population who are already housed. And I'm going to work close hour from um, from advocates who have been working on this and and to address those exact issues. I mean, I think the question is when people don't have income or when people are going to miss payments, uh, are they going to get you know evicted or in legal land ejected? Um, so I think we'll, we'll hear that in a little bit. Um, Lisa, if you can just hold on and, and, um, after we do these next two questions and then Dave will go through the rest of the bill and then we'll see where that, that sugars off, if that's okay. Thank you. Okay. Next I have John, um, John, I got to scroll down and find you. Um, John Kalaki's unmuted. Yes. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for this. Um, a, a question I have with all this is, I, I think like all of us, we've been listening into um, daily meetings with commissioners and everybody is so full out trying to respond to this. I, I hope that we're not making this more complicated by the put aside a 5 billion and then we ask these departments to create all these new processes when I think they're all working so hard to be responsive. So. I would just say that like in the Department of Children and Families shall develop a process for the community partners, develop an expedited application process. I think the departments are already trying to do that. And I wonder if in this situation, if we just, if it's 5 million or whatever, that we allow this and we have the parameters and let the departments decide how best to put that, those, those dollars in play, those additional dollars in play because it is a crisis and I think we should make it simpler and not give more work to the different departments because I think this could slow things down instead of expedite things. That's all I have to say. Great, thank you, John. Um, there is a phone call that just came on, someone whose phone number ends 4477. Are you on the line? Yes, it's Mary Howard. My um, iPad for some reason um, died. So, um, okay. Uh, but it great. is charging. So I am listening. Okay, great. Thanks, Mary. I'm going to meet you then. Um, ja, Chip Triano has his hand up and Chip, you are unmuted. But thanks. Uh, Tom. I, I, I think I wanted to address some of what Lisa and John both said. It was my understanding that, um, related to COVID-19, and the um, degree of contagiousness that exists within this, um, that uh, it was determined that um, homeless shelters were dangerous uh, to, uh, to, continue, to continue to operate um, as a result of um, numerous homeless people having um, uh, compromised immune systems and, uh, and uh, health that's not uh, up to 100% uh, standard. So it was my understanding that the connection with uh, DCF was that they administer um, the uh, voucher program and that this $5 million would supplement the voucher program um, and allow uh, people, uh, homeless people in shelters to be placed in motel rooms. Now, my understanding is that that is already happening in some locations. Um, uh, when I spoke with the Econo Lodge, where I stay generally um, last week to make sure they understood that I wasn't coming back, um, he, they related to me that a number of uh, homeless people had been placed there in rooms. Now there are um, uh, 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 numerous um, uh, hotel or motel rooms available within the state. The other piece on the news last night was uh, the use of, um, of trailers uh, in North Beach Park um, to house people. So it was my understanding that DCF, uh, as it pertains to um, placement of people out of shelters in 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 uh, in housing or uh, situations that uh, they would not be um, violating the 
uh, recommendations and uh, gathering recommendations that have been set forth by both the federal and the uh, state government. That was my understanding of the way this should read. I do question um, the uh, section where it does mention, mention, homeless, mention homeless shelters because um, uh, it's my understanding that uh, those are no longer viable uh, in this current situation. Okay, thank you. Um, so David, do you, can you continue onward? Yes. Thank you. I hope you can hear me okay. So far, so um, good. Good. Um, so I've, 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 on line 14 here, you'll see I designate the next piece as the original draft placeholder language. Um, so an A here, notwithstanding any provision of the law to the contrary, provisions apply to the duration of any state of emergency declared by the governor until 60 days after the governor terminates state of emergency and applies to any individual who is unable to work due to his or her own illness, illness of a member of his or her household, isolation required by his or her employer, isolation required by state or local government authorities, or isolation required by his or her primary care provider or other health official. I'm going through this, uh, A, because we haven't seen it to, before together, but B, because uh, the way I originally wrote this, um, it definitely was targeted uh, to populations directly affected by the virus um, and, the, and the aftermath. And in the next piece in section nine, uh, at least right now, applying to evictions and foreclosures, that that is across the board. So um, there, is a, there is definitely a fundamental question for you to consider when you're uh, hearing me out on these two versions of section nine. And, and that fundamental question is, do you want to try to limit whatever you're doing somehow just the people who are affected uh, by the virus? And if so, how are you gonna demonstrate that? How's that gonna play out? Versus do you want to go across the board? Okay, so keep that in mind. <laughs> You'll see in B here, if a tenant of a residential dwelling unit notifies the landlord that the tenant is unable to continue making timely payments under a residential rental agreement, the landlord shall not issue a notice of termination of tenancy for non-payment of rent or commence an action of ejectment pursuant to 12 VSA chapter 169 for non-payment of rent until 60 days after the government's state of emergency. Okay, so that's just, um, that is just for ejectment actions for tenants. Um, and then C, if a tenant or homeowner notifies a water, sewer, or electric utility that the tenant or homeowner is unable to continue making timely payments under a utility service agreement, Utilities shall not disconnect service to the residents until 60 days after the governor terminates state of emergency. Um, does not have right now a piece on foreclosures. Um, it could, it would mirror subsection B and just say you can't initiate a foreclosure action against a person affected by the virus until 60 days after. Um, as far as the utilities, I don't know if that's something you want to address. Uh, the Public Utility Commission has issued by rule uh, an emergency order to not to, to, to halt disconnections. Um, so I don't know that that's necessary right now. I'm not sure if it's within your jurisdiction, something you're looking at in this bill. Um, but those are sort of the placeholder pieces from the original version. I'm going to keep moving now, if I can, through the... Uh, Vermont Legal Aid proposal in this alternative section nine. As I said, this is based on language the VLA submitted. Um, I've tried my best to convert it to uh, statutory language. It is more comprehensive and specific to the actions that are, you know, possible or in process in court. So it's a little bit 
a little bit heavy on the court jargon, but at its biggest picture, at the highest level, it essentially says to the courts, you need to pause any existing proceedings that relate to ejectments or foreclosures. And although new proceedings could start, they will be stayed immediately pending this emergency period. So that's the biggest picture view of what's going on here. But I'm gonna move through the language uh, and ask you to bear with me. So starting on page 11, there are definitions. Emergency period means the period beginning with the governor's declaration of a state of emergency on March 13th, 2020, arising from COVID-13, the whole different, whole different virus, and ending 60 days after the governor terminates the state of emergency by declaration. So that's going to be a defined term used throughout this section nine. And again, starts March 13th, it ends uh, whenever the governor terminates the state of emergency, and he would have to do so by declaration in order for the emergency period as defined to end. A foreclosure here means a foreclosure action brought on LVSA chapter 172 against a dwelling house as defined in 12 VSA 49312. Um, I'll go to B, duties. This section does not relieve a tenant of the obligation to pay rent pursuant to 9 VSA 4455 or relieve a borrower under a residential loan agreement of the obligation to make timely payments pursuant to the terms of the loan agreement. So I want to flag something here between A and B, and that is the issue of commercial leases. So as you probably know we have a chapter that specifically deals with landlord tenant law residential rental agreements 9 VSA chapter 137. Um, and this definitely addresses that issue. We do not have a comparable chapter that sets up essentially minimum protections or standards for commercial leases in the same way. Obviously for somebody's housing the, the legislature, the state has made policy choices that there are gonna be certain minimum provisions to protect tenants um, and landlords. But again, we don't have a comparable chapter that addresses business leases for property, commercial leases. So um, there's a question whether this should apply to that. And it's a little bit complicated by the fact that ejectment actions under 12 VSA chapter 169 govern both. And so I think um, you're going to wanna to make a decision about whether you want this to apply to commercial leases, and then you'll want to be explicit somewhere here, maybe under B to say either this does or does not apply to commercial leases and for ejectment actions. Um, there are other issues for commercial leases that I'm not gonna go into, but those might include things like personal guarantees. Those are largely governed by private contract. Um, so something to have on your mind. I know some of your constituents are concerned about that from a business perspective. <clears throat> I am gonna move forward. The reason that C here is highlighted is that um, it's a change from this morning relative to the version that went out last night. So if you've already seen this uh, VLA proposal yesterday evening, this is different as of this morning. Um, and I'll, it, it's a slight change, I'll tell you how. So the way these subsections are gonna move is how do we address things that are already pending in the court? And how do we address new things that might come up. So subsection C relates to pending foreclosure and ejectment actions. So under one, upon the effective date of this act, all pending actions for ejectment under 12 VSA chapter 169, 
actions for foreclosures under 12 VSA Chapter 172 and outstanding orders in those actions are stayed until the end of the emergency period. So that if this takes effect, if this becomes law, it immediately pauses all ejectments and foreclosures. And under C2, a court of this state before which is uh, pending any matter stayed pursuant to subdivision one shall issue any necessary orders and provide notice to the parties of the stay not later than five days after the effective date of this act. Under D, this relates to new foreclosure and ejectment actions. So during the emergency period, a landlord, and this is a residential landlord, may commence an ejectment action pursuant to 9 VSA Chapter 137 and 12 VSA Chapter 169. So that means you'd have to follow the normal law for ejectment, whatever basis it is, um, whether it's non-payment of rent or other reason, you'd still have to comply with underlying law. Um, and a residential mortgage lender may commence a foreclosure action pursuant to 12 VSA Chapter 172 only by filing an action for the civil division of the Superior Court and not by service pursuant to Vermont Rule of Civil Procedure 3. And then under two, the court shall stay the action as of the date of filing until the end of the emergency period. So in plain English, what that means is you can still start a case if you follow the law as it stands. You can only start the case by filing it with the court. You can't just send the paperwork to the tenant or to the borrower. And as soon as you file it, the court will stay the action immediately. So it will be suspended before the court. It's not going to move forward. That's what's going on here in D. Mr. Chair, I'm just going to keep going unless you want to pause at these subsections. I think what's left, I just want to, if you only have a little bit left, then um, yeah. let's just finish the, the walkthrough before we get to specific questions. Okay, I'm going to keep going then. Thank you. So in subsection B, e, this relates to writs of possession that are not yet issued. So during the emergency period, a court shall not issue a writ of possession, one, in an ejectment action. Uh, either pursuant to 12 VSA 4853AH because a tenant failed to pay rent into court or pursuant to 12 VSA 4854, the court has entered judgment in favor of the plaintiff but did not issue a writ of possession with a judgment. So that's ejectments. And then for two, in a strict foreclosure action pursuant to 12 VSA 4941E because the property is not redeemed, or three, in an action for foreclosure by judicial sale pursuant to 12 VSA 4946D upon expiration of the period of redemption. That is a lot of hardcore legalese, I understand. Let me say it back to you in plain English. So remember that the writ of possession is uh, what happens when a court has decided that the owner or landlord of the property has the legal right to possess the property again. While you're a tenant, while you're a borrower, you have the legal right to the exclusion of all others to enjoy the property, right? The landlord can't just come in and come out. Um, the right to quiet enjoyment plus underlying statutory law says, if you're the tenant under a lease agreement or if you're the borrower uh, under a loan agreement and you own the property, you have the exclusive right to use that. When you breach your agreement, whether it's your lease or your mortgage agreement, the landlord or the lender are gonna sue you. And part of what they want is to have the right to possess the property again. So that is what the writ of possession is. It's when the court has judged that the landlord is, has the right to come back onto the property and take possession. And they issue this writ, and that's an old archaic term to just basically say a piece of paper that goes to a sheriff or a constable, and they bring it to you and they say, a court has decided 
that the landlord gets this property back and has the right to possess it and you have to leave. So subsection E here says, whether it's an ejectment, it's a foreclosure, for whatever reason, and the reasons are here, the court is not gonna issue one of those writs of possession during the emergency period. Um, in E1A, the reference, uh, because a tenant failed to pay rent into court, that's one of the bases that you might get a writ of possession. We have this uh, section of law 4853A that would require in some cases, a tenant to pay rent into court. If they fail to do so, then um, basically the court will issue the writ of possession and say, you didn't pay rent into court. I'm issuing, the, I'm putting the landlord back into possession. Under E1B, um, this is written because sometimes the writ of possession is issued at the same time that the judgment is entered. Um, so if there's already been a judgment, there may have already been a writ. So this would not be a writ not yet issued because that would already have been issued with a judgment. So in those cases where the writ of possession is not issued at the same time as the judgment, if there's a delay for some reason, that's where this would come in and say, even though you did your judgment, if you didn't issue the writ at that same time, you're not gonna issue it now, okay? In two and three, these are the foreclosure provisions, uh, but they work the same way for purposes of this. After the court has ruled in the foreclosure action, um, then uh, there is a period of redemption for property. And once that period runs, and if the tenant or the, the borrower failed to redeem the property, so to pay back all of the owed amounts and costs and fees and interest and all kinds of stuff, at that point, they have lost the chance to redeem the property, the court will issue a writ of possession. So that's what's going on in E. I hope that helps. So F, <clears throat> similar situation here. What happens if that writ has already been issued. So we've already gone to that point, but now this bill is gonna pass and there are might be some writs floating out there in the world. So under F, during the emergency period, following a judgment in an ejection action or a foreclosure action here and one, if the defendant was served a writ of possession not more than 60 days prior to the effective date of the act, then under A, the defendant is not required to surrender possession until the end of the emergency period, and the sheriff or constable who served the writ shall provide written notice of the delay to the defendant. Under two, if a writ of possession was issued by the court but not yet served, the sheriff or constable shall not serve the writ and shall return it to the plaintiff. And three, the directive here that the courts and legal aid shall coordinate to ensure the defendants in ejectment actions receive notice of the delay to uh, had a judgment against you and even though there may be a writ already issued those are going to be suspended and we're going to try to inform everybody of the delay all right <clears throat> So the last piece here is G, resumption of rent escrow hearing. So for a period of 45 days after the emergency period ends, I made that up. I don't know if that's the right period or not. I just put that in here as a placeholder. Notwithstanding 4853 AD, and that is the piece, this is the piece about paying rent into court. Under one, if a court finds that a tenant is obligated to pay rent and has failed to do so, a court shall order full or partial payment into court of not more than one month's rent. And in setting the amount to be paid into court, the court may consider a tenant's inability to pay due to circumstances arising in the emergency period. So this is a change to existing law uh, for a, some period after the emergency ends. Right now, the law says, if you're going to pay rent in the court, the court is going to require you to pay all of it. 
And that's a lot, right? That's everything that's accruing over time. And that could have been six months or nine months. Who knows how long this is going to last? Um, so this is saying when the emergency period ends, for some time after that, the court is only going to require you to pay one month's rent or less into court under that section of law. And under two here, the court has some discretion to weigh your circumstances to decide how much you have to pay in. And that could be zero, but it could be, it could be less than one month's rent. One month would be the max. The last piece, H, outreach and recommendations. So not later than one week after the emergency period ends, representatives of the Vermont judiciary, landlords, legal aid, and other stakeholders shall report to the General Assembly and governor concerning recommendations for how writs previously issued and existing orders to pay rent into court should be addressed, balancing the interests of all parties, and two, a plan for orderly adjudication of all state ejectment and foreclosure actions. That's it for this version of section nine. So let me, uh, let me recap in 30 seconds what's going on and what you need to consider, I guess, in section nine. The biggest question is, should you hit pause on court actions? Should you include ejectment actions and foreclosure actions or both? Should that include commercial property or just residential? What do you do about actions that are already filed? Do you let them continue and play out or do you hit pause on them? And what do you do about new actions? Do you allow them to be filed but just pause them immediately? and they'll continue after the emergency? Or do you say, we're not gonna commence any new actions until this is over? That's all I have. Thank you, David. Um, we have three hands up. I'm gonna go with Matt, then Chip, then John. So Matt, I've got to scroll down and find you and unmute you. uh all right i'm going to yep can you all right um so yep. this is um an idea that i i've floated by congressman welch to look at at the federal level around uh commercial and residential leases and mortgages and spoke to a couple of other people about so what is and this is a little out of the box but what if we suspended all residential and commercial mortgage payments due for 90 days like just pushed out the due date, 90 days, extend the life of the commercial and residential mortgages, 90 days, nobody has to pay anything like hard stop. Are you asking what are the potential legal consequences of that action? Yeah, just an idea. I'm just floating it. Like, could we, just, could we do that? I know that's probably a little bit more of a question for the Commerce Committee, but, um, if we just said nothing do 90 days move out then everybody's got room to breathe just floating it out there sure well so i mean on the one side are the policy and economic choices that are in your discretion to make you know is that a good idea what are the ramifications for who has to bear the burden of that those are policy choices you would have to make on the legal side um you know, frankly, doing that would uh, abrogate underlying contracts across the board. Um, a bank, a landlord could challenge that action, say it's a violation of the commerce clause, uh, contracts clause. I have no idea whether that challenge would be successful. It is uh, an emergency period and there are strong public interests that might uh, weigh in favor of the law upholding it, but I don't know. I've, no idea. I mean, it, there, there's definitely a legal grounds for, uh, you know, somebody to challenge that statute. Hey, it's unconstitutional. Whether they sure. win, I have no idea. No, no, no. And I understand that. I just didn't know if we were capable of 
if the legislature or governing bodies were capable of executing something like that, because we are in a federal and state of emergency at the, at the federal and state level, if we would be able to navigate that sort of cumbersome legality through the private contracts as a result of being in a state of emergency and it only being a temporary period of time. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the analysis might seem more complicated than it is, but uh, it's not, it's pretty straightforward. So as a state, you know, you have the constitutional authority uh, to exercise the police power, which is extremely broad. Um, any power is not vested in the federal government by the US Constitution or elected the state. Call those the police powers. Anything to promote the health, safety, welfare of the populace. And uh, it is the basis of everything that you do. And as a legislature, you can pass whatever law you want. You can say whatever you want. And it will be the law in this state until a court of competent jurisdiction determines that what you did was unconstitutional because it exceeded your authority. And the limit on your authority is the US Constitution. And one provision of that is the contracts clause. And that says that uh, a, law, a law cannot basically uh, abrogate the rights, duties, and responsibilities of an existing contract retrospectively. You can always do it prospectively, but retrospectively, you may have a problem on your hands. If somebody brings a challenge on that basis, then the court will essentially balance the equities of the social benefits to be gained versus the private costs imposed. And um, in the last hundred years, people have only lost, uh, states have only lost two contracts clause cases. The question of whether this is an emergency, um, those fat is, it's one of the factors that a court would weigh in whether or not you've exceeded your authority. The fact that it's emergency does not do anything uh, really relative to what authority you have as a legislature to pass a law. You can always pass the law. The question is, will it be challenged? And if it's challenged, will it be overturned? I hope that helps. Chip, you're up. Uh, OK, so um, I like Matt's idea, actually. Um, it might be worth um, some more conversation on it, but um, I'm looking at uh, page 10 um, in the uh, eligibility requirement or the eligibility um, sites due to uh, illness or the rest or all isolation. And I guess my question is that um, from what I've been hearing in communities and around the state is that um, uh, one of the major um, concerns regarding payment of rent is being employed and not having any income. So I guess my question is, should we be including, uh, you just went by it, David, it's, it's go the other way a little bit, page 10. Yeah, right here. So um, is her own, her own illness or illness of a family member and then isolation, isolation, isolation. Um, so I'm wondering if we should not add um, uh, um, lack of ability to pay rent as a result of um, loss of, uh, loss of uh, um, wages or uh, being unemployed or something of that nature. I guess that's for conversation. Um, <clears throat> the other piece, I do think it's important to uh, codify um, some of these um, um, eviction and, um, and foreclosure issues. Uh, from what I had he have heard and read, um, that um, the governor is somewhat reluctant to do this. Um, but I've also heard that um, from Judge Grierson that courts have sort of put this on hold, um, but the bottom line is it would be up to a judge. And, and, and so there's no um, um, continuity in, in uh, jurisdictions around the state apparently as to what a judge might do um, even with a proposed uh, unofficial hold on evictions and foreclosures. But in the same light, I think it's important to consider uh, evictions and foreclosures in the same, um, in the same uh, act or the same bill 
um, because we want to protect renters and landlords because if renters can't pay their rent and landlords can't pay their mortgages, then um, they need as, uh, protection as well. So uh, some sort of moratorium uh, that is codified in law, I think is important um, in this piece. Those are my observations. And uh, I guess one was the question about uh, eligibility. So to your first point, I, I want to caution you all not to conflate the two different versions of section nine here. These uh -huh. requirements that are showing on my screen are part of the original proposal. Yeah. Those are not included in the subsequent proposal. Um, as I said, the original proposal was limited to these factors that you're noting. Um, as far as uh, illness or isolation, that was the original draft. The subsequent draft, the second draft does not include those limitations. And that's certainly a question um, that you've, a good one that you've raised is, you know, should it be narrowed to this population or some other population or should it be across the board? On your second point, um, I, I can tell you a few things about what the state of affairs is right now. Um, so uh, HUD at the federal level last week um, announced that it was going to initiate a 60 day moratorium on foreclosure proceedings and eviction related foreclosure proceedings essentially for all federally uh, issued, guaranteed or insured mortgages across the country. And across the country, that's about 65% of the mortgages that are outstanding right now. So that's a 60 day moratorium during which the federal government is not going to initiate or continue uh, pursuing uh, a foreclosure or an eviction related for, uh, foreclosure related eviction for any federally insured guaranteed mortgage. So of that 65% in the country, to how many mortgages does that apply that? in Vermont? I don't know. Um, I assume it's a substantial number in Vermont. It's not everybody. Um, similarly, HUD announced that it was going to allow uh, lenders and borrowers through Freddie and Fannie for those guaranteed loans to renegotiate their terms or seek forbearance for up to 12 months. So it is possible that people who are having trouble in their residential mortgage loans could go to their lender and try to reno renegotiate terms for up to 12 months. Again, that's that same population of federally attached loans. And that's for residential mortgages. That's not for commercial loans like landlords or businesses. As to the Vermont courts, yeah. um, they have promulgated emergency rules that uh, have suspended most actions in the courts. However, as you indicate, Representative Troiano, um, landlord tenant proceedings are not necessarily suspended. Um, some of them are carved out from uh, what's, con or it, what's considered to be an emergency. And it is, as you said, in the discretion of the judge, what constitutes an emergency, whether a landlord tenant eviction action or other action needs to be taken up or not. Um, there, it is not an across the board pause on landlord tenant actions in the Vermont courts at this time. Okay, I, I want to be mindful of the time here. Um, first, I have a question before John, before I get to you. Um, I see that your hand is still, that your hand is raised. Uh, Ron, are you still on the line? I'm here. <clears throat> so what is our schedule for, for the next half of the day? In terms uh, of this, in terms of this, and using Zoom for a meeting? We are scheduled from uh, 1230 to 2.30. <clears throat> this meeting was scheduled to end at 11.30 and then resume again at 
Okay. Um, I don't, but in, I don't know that we're infringing on anyone else's Zoom time. I mean, right. So, um, so John, if I could ask you to hold off on your question till we start up again at twelve thirty. Um, the one, uh, and Angela, if you are still on the line, I just want to know if you have anything. I gotta, I gotta find you. Um, on the list and I just wanted to know whether or not you had anything to um, share with us right now or if you want to wait until later on this afternoon um, but uh, you're on you're um, unmuted All right thank you representative Stevens this is the lens assistant can everybody hear me all right it's it's fuzzy but keep trying okay is the plan to take this up again this afternoon? I think we'll continue this conversation. We're also going to share the time in this afternoon to um, talk about alcohol stuff. There's no, we're not going to be able to vote on this this today. There's way too much in it. Um, so I think that the idea is to, um, you know, is to be able to hear from folks like you or, um, uh, and then also to get a uh, feedback from people who have, who have been out in the world in terms of the homeless stuff to be able to share some of their thoughts. But, um, but yeah, we'll be taking this up at 1230 if you wanted to, if you wanted to come back later. I think I'm like some of the other folks on this call are, uh, have uh, some time already booked in Senate uh, for yeah. some of the yeah. same issues. Um, having had a chance to review uh, at least the, the legal aid proposal, um, it actually provides a pretty comprehensive um, approach to this situation. Um, I would have some requested changes or perhaps some clarifications, and I'm happy to provide those to the committee in writing if that's easier at this point. Um, but in terms of, you know, global um, proposal for dealing with this that is sort of as comprehensive as I've seen um, and as long as the proposal is coming with some sort of money for rental assistance for tenants and landlords to take um, take advantage of or to uh, utilize um, that no sense Okay, that that please do please share what you can, and um, and then if you can join us after the Senate stuff, you're more than welcome to. Um, okay. But yeah, if you have stuff that you want to send in the in in this little lunch break, that would be, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and I know that I know that Chris Donnelly from Champlain Housing Trust wants to speak a little bit later, um, in the afternoon and. Um, and I'm sure Earhart or Jean Murray is here from, has been on all morning from, from Vermont Legal Aid. And if there's, if there's stuff that you want to share, I think we'll just pick that up this afternoon. Um, John, do you want to um, be on, you're on, you're on muted, John. No, you're not. You're. Sure. Thank you. You're all set for now. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so everybody, I think let's just take a break now and come back at 12.30. Um, same, pro same process if you, if you, can, uh, if you can remember it. Uh, who was that? It was David. Hi, David. So Senate Economic Development is scheduled to take up landlord-tenant issues, evictions, foreclosures uh, from 12 till 1.15 today. Okay, I thought they were working on um, paid family leave issues. <laughs> okay, if you could just inform them that we're working on the same things and you're more than welcome to share the language that, uh, that we are, that, that you prepared for us, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's, that's where we are and then um, then you know, come back later, and we'll we'll have a conversation about it, about what we worked on, what we heard this morning, and then we'll um, and then we'll wait to hear back from you at some point 
either this afternoon or the next time we meet about what the Senate was working on. And um, we certainly have more stuff to work on this afternoon as well. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you in a little bit.